So uh, I speak about cosmology today. And uh, when you look to the sky at night, uh, you see darkness and you see stars. And, uh, and this simple fact is very important for cosmology. Because uh, cosmology is the science which studies uh, uh, the universe as a whole system. And uh, the very important fact is that uh, behind stars, you see darkness in between stars. And uh, let's see why that's important. This is just uh, to convince you that uh, even uh, with the uh, most powerful uh, telescope we have, the Hubble Space Telescope, and even in the most crowded uh, field of stars, uh, you still see darkness uh, between stars. Well, this uh, problem goes back to Isaac Newton when uh, he tried uh, to apply his gravitation law to stars. And uh, he obtained a surprising result. He said, well, uh, if uh, stars are uh, distributed and they attract each other, as I'm sure they do, then uh, any over-density of stars would attract the surrounding stars and would produce uh, attraction and would grow. And in the end, uh, all the universe would collapse in this uh, over-density. We don't see this. So the only solution he was able to find was uh, to hypothesize that uh, the universe is infinite so that uh, the net force on a given star is uh, basically zero, is uh, the same force uh, from all stars on the left of this given star, and the all force uh, from all the stars on the right of this given star would just uh, compensate, and the star would not uh, move. So that's, uh, that was the, the Einstein's, uh, um, sorry, uh, Newton's uh, um, idea. The idea of a steady, infinite universe was already been introduced by Giordano Bruno, but that was uh, philosophy. Here, Newton is using physics, so there is a big difference. Unfortunately, there are three big defects uh, in this uh, cosmology from Newton. First defect is that the theory is not stable. So random perturbation could anyway drive the system to collapse. The second problem is that uh, in mathematics, you study uh, limits and you know that uh, infinite minus infinite doesn't always give zero, can give uh, a positive number, a negative number, minus infinite, plus infinite, anything. So this uh, also this idea of uh, compensating infinite forces uh, is not correct. And third, uh, the night sky would be as bright as the sun. This is the big issue against, uh, and was the first issue which was uh, raised against uh, this idea of uh, an infinite uh, uh, universe uh, filled with stars. So this, uh, this problem was already uh, introduced by Johannes Kepler in uh, 1610. He already asked, why is the sky dark at night? And this question then was reiterated by Eric Olbers in the 19th century, so that now is, called as, is known as the Olbers paradox. The paradox arises from the fact that in an infinite universe, wherever you look, uh, sooner or later, your line of sight will hit a star. So we'll see light. You will see light, and you will see a uniform glowing sky, even at night. This is a paradox, and this paradox took a lot of time to be solved. Uh, was solved only with the introduction of the modern cosmology, which is based on general relativity and is based on particle, nuclear, and atomic physics. So today, using these uh, tools, uh, we believe that uh, the universe and the space itself e are evolving. And these so are very different from the static, rigid universe proposed by Newton. 
This conclusion is based on a large set of observations. And all these observations are explained simultaneously by the hot Big Bang model of George Gamow. So this is what I am going to speak about today. Well, today we don't uh, uh, speak about a universe made of stars. So we rather speak of a universe made of galaxies, which are the building blocks of the universe. These are collections of 100 billion stars or so. And uh, we know a huge number of galaxies, uh, and they come in a variety of shapes. Uh, they are elliptical, spiral, irregular, and really fill the universe uh, as far as you can see. And uh, this is uh, just to give you a, a, a scale of uh, what we are speaking about. Uh, galaxies are not the largest uh, uh, structures we see in the universe. They are organized in uh, clusters of galaxies, which are maybe organized in supercast clusters of galaxies. So there is a hierarchy of uh, structures in the universe. And I can just uh, uh, fast uh, go through this uh, gallery of different galaxies, collections of uh, stars, uh, which we know and which uh, we love so much. How are these galaxies distributed in the universe? They are distributed in a cellular structure, which uh, pr um, is made of filaments, uh, plain with uh, huge voids uh, of luminous matter in between. And we have uh, now observation from the uh, several uh, sky surveys uh, which uh, tell us that really this is the structure of the universe as far as we can observe with uh, optical observations. How these, these galaxies form and how these, this larger scale structure of the universe form. Why galaxies did not follow Newton's prediction and did not collapse in a single megastructure. And uh, if infinite galaxies fill the universe, uh, why, how can we avoid, avoid the Olber paradox for galaxies? This is uh, the questions I want to try to answer now. The first evidence is that we live in an expanding universe. Since uh, all galaxies, all distant, distant galaxies, appear to recede from us. So this was the, interpretations, the interpretation of observations from uh, Carl Wirtz first and then Edwin Hubble, which demonstrated that, that uh, the farther a galaxy is, uh, the redder is the, lights, the light we receive from that galaxy. And uh, this is based uh, on uh, two different measurements. Uh, one measurement is the measurement of distance, and the other measurement uh, is the measurement of uh, the color of characteristic lines uh, emitted by the galaxy. So um, the first interpretation of what was seen by Wirtz and by Hubble was uh, in terms of uh, Doppler shift. Light is made of uh, electromagnetic waves uh, and the color of light uh, is uh, our response to different uh, wavelengths of light. Uh, blue light has short wavelength, red light has longer wavelengths. And uh, the Doppler effect, which uh, arises every time a source is moving with respect to the observer, changes uh, the wavelength of light for the observer and transforms color. So, for example, if you have a, a moving source as the one uh, depicted there, uh, that source will produce a pattern of waves, uh, which is uh, as shown in the figure, so that uh, the observer on your right uh, uh, sees a longer wavelength, which means a redder color, since the source is receding from him. Well, what uh, both Wirtz and the Hubble found was uh, that uh, for all galaxies, the color is redder than expected, meaning that all galaxies are receding from us. And if you take uh, a, a, any catalog of distant galaxies and you try to 
histogram the number of galaxies with a given redshift, you will find all that all galaxies have a positive redshift, and you don't find any distant galaxy with a negative redshift. And this is already, already a big evidence and a strange evidence. Modern data show that uh, the farther the galaxy is, uh, the faster the recession is. So the redder is the light. So uh, this is uh, the modern data on the Hubble law, which show that uh, the recession velocity, or better, the redshift, uh, is proportional to distance uh, with a true constant uh, proportionality, which is about 7 kilometers per second for each megaparsec of distance of the, of the galaxy. So the most uh, democratic interpretation of this fact uh, is that the space itself is expanding uniformly, dragging galaxies with it so that uh, they recede from each other. So this hypothesis has an advantage. And the advantage is that there is no center for the expansion. And all points of this infinite universe are equivalent. And moreover, this hypothesis immediately explains the Hubble law. And my prefer preferred way to explain this is to look to a pancake which expands. You put the pancake in the oven and we wait uh, two hours, and after two hours, uh, the pancreas has grown by a factor two, say. So initially it was 10 to 20 centimeters, and after two hours is 40 centimeters. So you take uh, a reference uh, resin in the, in the pancake, which is uh, this one, is uh, our reference, and uh, a, another one, which initially is uh, five centimeters from the reference one, after uh, growing, will be at uh, 10 centimeters. So in two hours, it's moved by five centimeters. So the recession speed of that raisin is 2.5 centimeters per hour. But if you take a different raisin that uh, initially is at double the distance, then it will move uh, after two hours by... 10 centimeters, and its speed is double, is 5 centimeters per hour. So double distance implies double recession velocity. And you could choose any of these raisins as a reference, and you would find exactly the same law. So Hubble law is a direct consequence of an isotropic expansion of space, like the pancake in the oven. Now, a different question is why is the universe expanding? The fact that this expanding has been discovered 70 years ago, that's fine. It's been confirmed, there is no question now. Why that's happening, that's different. And we really need general relativity to explain this. So, First of all, if the universe is expanding now, it has to be being smaller in the past and denser in the past. So there should have been an initial state with very high density and very high temperature. And this uh, initial state is called uh, the Big Bang. In this Big Bang, the universe got a huge push and started to expand. And the situation is similar to the situation when you throw a stone vertically. If the, with the given amount of kinetic energy, uh, if the stone is very heavy, will just come back. If uh, the stone is very uh, light, it could escape Earth's gravitational field and uh, escape forever. So for a given push the universe got at the very beginning, if the universe is uh, light, low density, then the universe will expand forever. If the universe is heavy, high density, then the universe will expand and eventually recollapse. 
And uh, this uh, is uh, exactly what uh, we get uh, from the uh, Einstein equations of uh, general relativity applied to a uniform um, medium, infinite, and uh, filled with uh, uh, radiation and mass. So there is a critical density. If the density of this medium is low, the medium will expand forever. If the density of the medium is high, then the medium will expand and then recollapse. We are somewhere in this process. And uh, here there are three curves uh, giving the dimensions of the medium versus time in billion years. And you see that uh, if there is, uh, this is the critical density, for this density, the medium will expand and will just uh, stop uh, to expand only after an infinite time. For a higher density, the medium will expand and then recollapse. And then if you look to the numbers I wrote here, you see why we call it critical density, because uh, after one nanosecond, you change this number by one gram per cubic centimeters, and you can get completely different histories of the universe. So this solution of Einstein equation is not stable with respect to the initial conditions. And this is something strange which physicists really don't like. We don't like to be in this situation that our present existence depends on who tuned the density one nanosecond after the Big Bang. Let's try to explain that later, okay? And uh, let's see which are the other uh, forecasts of general relativity. There is one which is very good, is the redshift. According to the general relativity, redshift is just uh, the expansion of the wavelength of photons exactly as uh, all other lengths are increasing in the expanding universe. So we call it a cosmological redshift rather than Doppler shift. Doppler shift uh, uh, involves uh, the real movement of the source. Here is just uh, a source uh, which is dragged by the expansion of space. And all uh, the dimensions of the universe, including photon wavelengths, are increasing in this space. So in this uh, uh, framework, it's also easier to explain why we do see a lot of uh, uh, sources with the redshift very high. They are not moving at uh, a speed which is higher than the speed of light. They are just uh, observed now after light has uh, traveled in the universe, and the universe during this travel expanded by a factor three or four or five. So we see wavelengths which are three or four or five times longer. This means that if we want to see very far away sources, we need to use infrared wavelengths, long wavelengths. And uh, the, the farther objects we, we know have a redshift of about 10, which means that the wavelength we observe to be, today was 10 times smaller when it was emitted. The universe was 10 times smaller when this light was emitted. And uh, to observe this, uh, uh, the ultraviolet light from hot stars in these early galaxies, for example, uh, is now visible as infrared light. And uh, to detect infrared light, uh, you don't use your eyes, you use uh, infrared detectors, uh, which are sensitive to this wavelength. And the infrared astronomers have uh, tried very hard, and they are discovering galaxies which are uh, farther and farther, but there is uh, no hope to find galaxies at redshift uh, much higher than 10. Moreover, very early galaxies, morphologically, are very different from present galaxies, which means that there is an evolution in the universe. 
So the universe evolves before some redshift, some epoch, when the universe was, say, 10 times smaller. The universe did not include galaxies. Galaxies were not even formed at that epoch. The universe was more homogeneous and probably more simple. Gravitational instability, which has to be there, uh, produced galaxies from that homogeneous medium. The expansion of the universe has delayed this process. Otherwise, uh, we would have the problem of Newton's cosmology. But uh, since the expansion is so fast, uh, aggregating growing galaxies <coughs> is a slow process. And we don't have uh, any terrible collapse. So when I speak about the early universe, I'll speak about the universe before the formation of galaxies. The, that universe was uh, denser, was uh, hotter, and uh, the, early with, the earliest we consider, the hotter was the universe. And in the early universe, uh, the space was filled with uh, matter, very hot, so probably a gas or a plasma. And uh, structures could not form in that uh, uh, hot uh, medium because of the pressure of matter and of light present in that medium. So only when the temperature decreased in, with the expansion, uh, then the universe was able to form galaxies. So redshift and evolution, which I have tried to describe, explain Olbers' paradox. Our line of sight does not always hit a galaxy because our eyes are not sensitive to infrared light and because galaxies did not always exist. But if we observe with instruments sensitive to the infrared or millimeter wavelengths, we have the hope to see light which was present in the universe before the formation of galaxies. And in this way, we could observe the earliest past of our universe so we can do archaeology of the universe. So this is the idea. And this goes back to Camille Flammarion, which said that uh, since light travels at a constant speed, which is not infinite, then looking far away is the same as looking in the past of the universe. And we have several examples. Looking to the farthest galaxies we are able to observe, we see how was the universe some 10 or more billion years ago. So is it possible to look farther off? So is it possible to look back in time much closer to the origin of the universe? From what I said before, the answer is yes, is yes, but we should take into account the expansion and evolution of the universe. And this affects the way we look back in time. So we want to observe whatever was present before the formation of galaxies, and we need to observe it with instruments sensitive to very long wavelengths far infrared, microwaves, depending on how far in the past we want to go. George Gamow in the 50s pointed out that, that in the hot early universe there must have been a lot of light, a lot of photons, in thermal equilibrium with matter. This light should still be around, and because of the huge redshift, should be now present as a faint glow of microwaves. So in order to detect it, what we need is a microwave receiver. This uh, microwave has been, in fact, detected in 1965 and is the so-called cosmic microwave background. And uh, these two guys, Arno Pensians and Robert Wilson, did the detections. And, uh, you read uh, it was a serendipitous detection, but in reality, in reality, it was allowed by the techniques these two guys developed. 
So it's true, they were not looking for the cosmic microwave background, but they were looking for a very faint microwave signal. And since they used the high gain antenna and the low temperature detector, they did detect the cosmic microwave background. The physicists of the Princeton group realized that what Arno Pensians and Robert Wilson actually detected was really the uh, microwave background predicted by George Gamow 10 or 15 years uh, before. In this theory, the cosmic microwave background is a black body and it was a very hot black body in the primordial universe. And with the redshift and with the expansion of the universe, it diluted to a very low temperature black body at about 3 Kelvin degrees. And in 1992, the satellite COBE and the instrument FIRAS on board of COBE measured this black body spectrum, and uh, this is the me measurement by FIRAS, and the error bars here are 400 standard deviations. So just uh, to be visible in the plot, otherwise you just have uh, all the points on the theoretical curve. And this is an impressive evidence for a thermal origin of this radiation for thermal equilibrium in the early universe between this light and the matter. So what we see when we look to the cosmic microwave background? Well, we see a special epoch when the universe was about as hot as the surface of the sun. All times before, the universe was hotter, so was a plasma of ionized matter which is opaque. You do not see inside the sun. You see the surface of the sun. The interior of the sun is opaque to light. So was the universe earlier than this special time, which is called the recombination. After this the epoch, the universe becomes neutral. Hydrogen atoms are formed. And, um, and the universe becomes transparent. So we can do astronomy. So we can see far away in the universe. This recombination epoch happens at a temperature about 3,000 Kelvin degrees. And the universe was about 300,000 years old. Today, the universe is about 14 billion years old. So we can observe the universe as it was uh, when it was 50,000 times younger than today. The redshift of this epoch is about 1,000. It means that this early universe was 1,000 times smaller than it is today, and it was 1 billion times denser than today. So in that early universe, we expect uh, the presence of uh, small density fluctuations and uh, small temperature fluctuations. Denser region would be slightly hotter than the surrounding, and uh, rarefaction would be slightly colder than the surrounding. So this fluctuation could produce uh, uh, brighter and dimmer uh, spots in the image of the cosmic microwave background. These uh, fluctuations are called uh, anisotropies. One of the properties of the cosmic microwave background is that it's very, very isotropic. It's the same everywhere within, say, one part in 10,000, which is really incredible. But uh, below that level, we expect uh, fluctuations. And there is the deep link between these fluctuations and the formation of structures in the universe. And uh, this happens because in a plasma like uh, the early universe is, uh, any overdensity would uh, try to grow because its own gravity. And uh, growing would uh, 
increase its temperature. But when the temperature is increased, there is a larger number of photons around, so there is more pressure of the photons against the matter. So this uh, overdensity cannot grow anymore. The pressure of photons will re-expand it. So it will cool down until gravity is, again, more than the pressure. So we expect uh, that the density fluctuations just oscillate in the early universe. That's why we cannot form a galaxies in this early universe. After recombination, photons are not linked to matter because uh, hydrogen atoms have a smaller cross-section with respect to free electrons. So after recombination, an overdensity will just grow and grow and grow and it eventually will form a galaxy. So there is a particular epoch, which is recombination, when the density fluctuation start to grow and eventually will form a galaxy. These are the same density fluctuations we can picture taking a picture of the cosmic microwave background. So taking a picture of the cosmic microwave background, we will be able to see the first stage of the formation of galaxies. Well, to construct an image of the cosmic microwave background is difficult, and there's been a challenge for experimenters for more than 20 years. But let's first see which kind of image we expect. So let's see how happens that a photon starts from this epoch, the recombination epoch, and travels for 14 billion light years until, until it hits our detector. So let's start 14 billion years ago and take two regions. One is the location, our current location, and the other is the location of the universe, which is 14 billion light years away. Okay? And for sake of clarity, I've not uh, shown the expansion in the universe in these slides. So, a thousand years after the Big Bang, the universe is incredibly hot, and light does not propagate in the universe because uh, there are free, uh, continuous scattering against uh, free electrons. So the universe is opaque and incredibly hot. And uh, when the, the plasma cools down fully, say 100,000 years after the Big Bang, you start to see fluctuations of temperature in the universe, only if you increase the contrast of the image very much. And uh, you will have, um, say, colder region, hotter region, other regions. And, uh, we are still in this position, and uh, we still consider this other position 14 billion light years away. Now, the plasma cools down because the universe expands, and uh, these uh, densities cannot grow, can only oscillate, as I told before. When there is recombination, then light starts to propagate. So in this region uh, X, say we have uh, one cold region and two hot regions, and the light uh, starts uh, to move in all directions from this uh, region. We consider the direction which is uh, towards us because we will receive uh, this light uh, later on. So one million years after the Big Bang, the image of this uh, region has already uh, traveled for one million light years towards us. And uh, now light can move in the universe because the universe is transparent. And so in the subsequent uh, billion years, light will move. Meanwhile, sources, um, over densities will collapse and under density will lose their residual density towards over densities. So we expect that in the two regions which were uh, denser, 
we will have uh, finally galaxies, while in the underdense region we will have a void. Meanwhile, the image of this region is moving towards us, and uh, after 14 billion years, uh, we'll get to our telescope. What do we see in this image? We see that region as it was 14 billion years ago. So we will see the original under density and the two uh, over densities where today there are two galaxies and one void. Now, this is what we expect. We expect to have a fossil image of the universe as it was 14 billion years ago. It's similar to what uh, you do when you look to the surface of the sun. You see structure in the sur surface of the sun because there are hotter and colder regions. And uh, this light, uh, this image uh, travels for eight minutes uh, before getting to your eyes. In the same way, the image of this uh, cosmic photosphere travels for 14 billion light years before getting to our telescopes. And uh, meanwhile, from visible light becomes uh, microwaves because of the expansion and of the redshift. But we, we can find out more about uh, these uh, spots, uh, cold and hot spots, which is the typical size we expect for these spots. At recombination, the age of the universe is 300,000 years. The distance uh, light uh, can travel since the Big Bang to that epoch is 300,000 light years. And there is no communication over larger distances because there has not been enough time to communicate because bet between distances larger than that. There is lack of causal contact between distances larger than 300,000 light years. So the maximum size of the spots we expect cannot be larger than 300,000 light years because forces could not have worked, for example. So in, uh, we have a structure of 300,000 light years at a distance of 14 billion light years. And if you do the calculation and you take into account a factor 1,000 for the expansion of the universe, you find that you will see that structure under an angle of one degree. So in an Euclidean universe where you can uh, draw this uh, picture, you expect uh, a size, uh, a typical size of these spots of about one degree. According to general relativity, the universe, uh, the geometry of the universe could be non-Euclidean depending on the content of mass and energy of the universe. So there is a parameter, which is the omega parameter, which is the ratio of the density of uh, mass and energy to the critical density. And uh, this parameter can be one for a Euclidean geometry, can be more one for uh, a uh, uh, carved, positive carved geometry, and could be less than one for a negatively carved geometry. So what is the universe made of? We know it's done of uh, matter, baryons, uh, or luminous matter in several forms. And if we account for all this uh, luminous matter, we get about 5% of the critical density. Then we know that there is dark matter in the universe, matter which uh, we don't see, but has to be there to explain the dynamics of galaxies, of stars in galaxies, and so on. And this uh, is estimated to be around 30% of the critical density, but this number is very uncertain. And finally, there is an additional possibility, which is that there could be some quantity of repulsive dark energy, which is quite exotic, is a form of vacuum energy, and uh, this uh, could account for the recent evidence for an acceleration of the expansion of the universe. So these are the components. In addition, there is radiation, light, microwaves, whatever. 
uh, but this is a very small amount, very small amount. So if we count all the components we imagine could be present in the universe, then we can estimate omega, but this method is not very precise because we don't know all the components very, very uh, accurately. An independent method to count, to measure omega or to estimate omega is uh, to measure the geometry of the universe, which means uh, see the effect of uh, this uh, mass energy on the propagation of light. And uh, according to general relativity, the presence of mass and energy curves the space, and this was experimentally demonstrated since 1919, so it's a well-known effect. Today we see this effect very well in the images of distant sources, which appear double of, or triple or, or many, because they follow different paths from the source to the observer because of an intervening mass which curves the space. So there are two images of this quasar, one above and one below the this galaxy, for example, and this can be this situation here. So now, this effect works also at the largest scales. If uh, we have uh, a mass larger than the critical density, then the space is covered, and uh, instead of propagating along uh, straight lines, photons follow curved lines. For example, is the, if the density of the universe is high, then two paths, two rays starting parallel will converge somewhere. If the density is low, two light rays will diverge. And you have a, an evident, uh, in a, an example of this, if you take uh, the surface of the Earth, you consider the equator and two persons starting to head north from the equator. They start along parallel lines, but in the pole they converge. This is because the space where they are walking is not flat, it's curved. The same do photons in the 3D space due to the curvature of space. So if we have a way to see if photons curve their uh, trajectories, then we can determine the density of the universe. This is a small effect locally. We have seen with galaxies. These are arc seconds of changes, so it's very uh, small, but uh, if we want to do the test over a cosmological distance, then we need uh, to test over cosmological scales, and the cosmic microwave background can provide what is needed to do the test. So we take uh, this uh, ruler, which is 300,000 light years long, and we see if we see it under an angle of one degree, or two degrees, or half a degree. If we see on two degrees will be a high density universe, density larger than the critical density. If we see it under an angle of half a degree, we'll see it, we, we say it will be in a low density universe. So these spots in the cosmic microwave background could appear typically one degree or typically two degrees or typically half a degree depending on the density of the universe. This was enough to drive the search for anisotropy in the cosmic microwave background. The measurement has been incredibly difficult. And only after 27 years of efforts, the COBE satellite of NASA detected the first anisotropy. Before, we only had upper limits. And uh, the DMR instrument on the COBE satellite produced the, these maps of the sky with a very low angular resolution. Uh, in these images, it was evident that far from the plane of our galaxies, there was a fluctuation in the temperature of the cosmic micro background at the level of 10 parts per million. So 
DMR did not have a real telescope. It was a small satellite with, with antennas. So the angular resolution was quite coarse, 10 degrees. It was not enough to see the spots we want to see to find omega, to find the density of the universe. So after COBE, being reassured that, that uh, these fluctuations were indeed present, people started to build higher angular resolution experiments. And this is uh, the improvement uh, we needed uh, to go and see the details. If you take uh, this uh, uh, famous starry night by Van Gogh, uh, the stars in this uh, picture have a size of about one degree. And if you dilute uh, this image uh, with uh, the resolution of Kobe, you see nothing. If you have a better resolution, like boomerang head, for example, then you start uh, to see the details, the structures in the sky. So we really needed a telescope for the cosmic microwave background for all the reasons I told you before, and uh, a sensitive microwave receiver. This is a microwave receiver. Unfortunately, this receiver is not sensitive enough to detect fluctuation in the cosmic microwave background. The cosmic microwave background itself gives about a few percent of the noise of this system. So you cannot uh, detect the microwave ground with this. There are better methods. Uh, but to do that, uh, we need uh, the telescope. We need sensitive microwave detectors. We need the system to cool, cool down the detectors so that we get very high sensitivity. We freeze the noise, and we only measure the cosmic microwave ground. We need the site uh, with uh, very small atmosphere, or no atmosphere at all, because the atmosphere on the Earth is not very transparent to microwaves. And we need a strategy to separate the small signal from the anisotropy of the cosmic microwave background from all other local signals, including the microwaves emitted by our own galaxy. And also we need the possibility to repeat these measurements many times and under different experimental conditions so that we can be confident of the result. To do this, uh, we built Boomerang, and Boomerang is, was a large collaboration of uh, many institutes in the world and was uh, funded in Italy by three agencies which are there and funded in the US by NASA, by the Antarctic program, and so on and uh, was based on the long duration balloon flight. So we took a giant balloon to carry the telescope above, above Earth atmosphere so that we solved one of those problems I listed before. A balloon uh, is uh, somewhat old fashioned, but, uh, but uh, uh, very effective for this kind of uh, measurements and cheaper than a satellite by two orders of magnitude. So uh, there is the opportunity to launch balloons over Antarctica and these uh, balloons will carry your instrument at 40 kilometers of altitude and will stay there in the stratospheric wind for a couple of weeks or more. You fly over Antarctica because there is a well-defined pattern of circulation in the stratosphere. And uh, so you have the hope that after two weeks, you get back to your site and you can recover the instrument. The other advantage of this kind of pattern is that uh, you fly over very different region of the Earth, so you can compare the effect of the Earth on your observations under very different conditions. And if you find the same results independent on what you are flying over, then you start to believe the results. Also, from Antarctica, you can target a region of the galaxy which is particularly free from microwave emission. And so you can look outside your, our galaxy to the cosmic microwave background. Yeah, there are details about uh, this telescope, and uh, I think I'll skip all these because uh, otherwise it would take forever. I only say that we use uh, thermal detectors called the bolometers, uh, which uh, 
absorb the incoming photons from the cosmic microwave background and heat up a little bit. And when I say a little bit, I mean one nano Kelvin. So we are able to detect changes of temperature, tiny temperature changes of the temperature of these bolometers due to the arrival of cosmic microwave background photons. These bolometers were invented a long time ago by Langley in the beginning of this century and since then improved a lot in their performance so that what would take 10 to the 15 years at the time of Langley now takes about one second. And that's why we can do this measurement, otherwise it would take more than the age of the universe. So uh, these detectors, particular detectors, were developed at JPL, Caltech, and uh, have then been used for the Planck satellite. So this is an example, one of the many examples where balloons are used to test technology to be then used on satellites. And I'll skip about all the details of the system. It was a complex system and it took uh, uh, ten, say six years of work full time of a big group of people to be developed. And uh, in the end we have the, this giant beast here where you see basically only the solar panels and uh, the shields which protect the telescope from sun radiation so that we cannot look at the cosmic microwave background. This system was able to scan the sky attached below the balloon with a precision of the order of one arc minute. And uh, here there are uh, photos of uh, the location in the Ross Sea in Antarctica. This is the Ross Sea. It's frozen for hundreds of kilometers. And uh, here are the Transantarctic Mountains. And the, here is the lab on the Ross Sea, on the frozen Ross Sea. And uh, it was cold. And uh, we brought uh, this, uh, all our staff there at the end of October of 1998. Uh, we worked a lot there. We tested the instrument. Uh, we made our calibrations uh, and finally, yes, uh, this was a good uh, way to move on that. And finally, we launched the instrument on the December 29th, 1998. Uh, and this is the movie of how the separation is done. And then uh, after two weeks, uh, we recovered the, the instrument uh, in good shape, let's say. <laughs> and we also had uh, the visit of a penguin, which is uh, a rare event there because it's not on the coast, it's far from the coast. Uh, the first thing we tried to see was a known source uh, before trying to see this faint, uh, strange uh, fluctuations. We looked uh, to Eta Carine, which is a wonderful uh, region of our galaxy. We saw it, we were very happy. And then we used the uh, nine days later to map the cosmic microwave background. And uh, this is the result. So this is the map of the cosmic microwave background at 150 gigahertz of frequency, two millimeters of wavelengths. This is basically the size of the moon, half a degree. And also by eyes, you can believe that uh, these spots have typically the size of one degree, typically. There are larger spots, smaller spots, but if you ask uh, which is the distribution of the size of these spots, uh, you will find that, that the peak in the distribution is exactly at one degree. And also, by measuring at, three different, at four different wavelengths, uh, we were able to show that uh, what we have seen is definitely cosmic microwave background and not something else, okay? Because that's the right uh, spectrum. And we were able to show that uh, the signal, so the map we see, is much more than the noise of the measurement and that there are no systematic effects. Again, we compare, for example, a map taken 
in the first week to a map taken when the second week when the experiment has drifted by 5,000 kilometers and we found that the, the two maps are very similar. So which is the typical dimension of the observer structure? This is the distribution. So angle, size of the structure versus temperature and the peak is at an angle of about one degree. So this is uh, the main result of this measurement because uh, if the size of the spots is one degree, the curvature of the universe is zero and the density of the universe is the critical density. This was published on Nature at the lot of uh, um, evidence and also we improved the, the measurement analyzing more data and found this uh, peak at one degree but also other two peaks uh, which uh, are expected in fact and are affected, expected and I'll take one minute just to explain why we do expect not only one peak but three peaks in this distribution. That's uh, again this fact of the oscillations of uh, matter inside the horizon. So the horizon is uh, the length which uh, light travels from the beginning of the universe to the considered epoch. So this horizon, of course, increases with time. And uh, when the horizon becomes larger than a given size of the perturbation, of a, an over-density, for example, then the perturbation can start to oscillate because at that point, the two edges of the perturbation will feel the force of the other point. So inside the causal horizon, forces act and the gravity acts and the perturbation starts to oscillate. So a small perturbation will start to oscillate before a larger one. And, so, and all the perturbations with that size in the whole universe will start to oscillate at that epoch. And all the perturbations with a light, larger size will start to oscillate at a later epoch. So perturbations which are smaller will arrive at the recombination with a different phase of perturbations which are larger. And the largest ones which we see are those which arrive at recombination maximally compressed with the phase which is the phase of maximum compression. So these are basically 300,000 light years big and they produce the first peak in the distribution. Smaller perturbations can arrive with a different phase and this perturbation will basically arrive with the same temperature of the surroundings. So we'll see a dip in the distribution. We'll not see these perturbations. Smaller, even a smaller perturbation will arrive cold with the phase which is corresponding to maximum rarefaction. So they are cold. So again, we see this perturbation. So we see a second peak. And then even a smaller perturbation will arrive with the average density. So we'll see a dip and so on. So what we expect from this cosmic synchronization process is a sequence of peaks in the distribution of the temperature fluctuations, which has been observed which are the consequences for cosmology. Consequences are that the geometry of the universe is Euclidean. So omega is one, the density of the universe is the critical density. Since luminous matter provides only 5% of the density and dark matter provides maybe 30%, then we have something missing. And uh, this uh, missing uh, mass energy could be the dark energy necessary to explain supernova uh, observations. So we have this uh, strange composition of the universe with normal matter, which is about 5%, dark matter, which has never been 
measured in the lab, which is 30%. And dark energy, which has never been measured in the lab, and we don't know what it is, which is 65%. What can I say? I can say that cosmology is in very good shape because we made predictions, uh, we made uh, observations, the observations match predictions. Physics is not in very good shape because it's not able to explain what is dark matter and what is dark energy. Let's put this in this provocative way. We are ignorant, that's clear. Uh, there are other parameters of the universe we can observe uh, using these uh, measurements, I'll skip that. The other important fact is that uh, that solution of the Einstein equations corresponding to a critical density is not stable. We have seen that before. So we need something which uh, uh, produces uh, a critical density universe starting from generic initial conditions. Otherwise, the coincidence would be too strange, okay? The theory of inflation is one theory coming from elementary particles, which starts to, tries to answer this problem. If uh, there is a phase transition in the very early universe, and you can put, uh, we don't know where to put uh, this phase transition. We could put it at the epoch when uh, forces are unified or something like that. If there is this phase transition, then uh, the early universe will expand very, very fast so that any initial curvature will be stretched to a flat curvature. So a Euclidean universe. So there is a link between uh, the uh, very early universe and the later universe uh, and uh, the curvature. And uh, the curvature is expected to be flat because of this uh, use, uh, huge uh, expansion in a transition phase. This also explains, if it's true, the origin of density fluctuation. We started this uh, talk saying, uh, let's consider a density fluctuation, but why it has to be there? Well. If uh, inflation is there, then uh, quantum fluctuations at the subatomic scales will become, after inflation, density fluctuations at uh, the cosmological scales. And uh, you can uh, predict uh, the kind uh, and the distribution of these fluctuations from inflation, and you get exactly what uh, you measure. So these two facts, the distribution of the fluctuations and the flatness of the universe, are um, in agreement with the inflation theory. Is this enough to prove inflation? Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, uh, and for sure, we need more evidence. For example, one of the predictions of the inflation theory is that uh, during this fast inflation of the early universe, gravitational waves are produced. These gravitational waves are very faint, will be very, very difficult, if not impossible, to detect them, even with the LISA satellite. So the very best we can do. But uh, fortunately, There is another way to detect uh, these uh, inflationary gravitational waves. And this way would be <coughs> to measure the uh, polarization of the cosmic microwave background. Not only the energy we receive, but also the direction of the waves uh, pr constituting the cosmic microwave background. So there are several experiments aimed to do that. <coughs> and I skip all this because it's very late. But the idea is to measure the pattern of the polarization directions for all these waves coming from the early universe. And there is a very peculiar pattern which is characteristic of inflationary gravitational waves. So we have tried to do this. We have produced 
polarization sensitive sensors, which are different from the normal ones. And we have flown them again in Antarctica, deja vu, OK? And uh, we have flown them in 2003, in January. We didn't have all the luck we had before, but uh, still we were able to make our measurements to recover the data from Don Fuji, which is very high, very cold, very difficult to reach anyway. And uh, we were able to produce uh, this uh, map of the polarization vectors of the cosmic microwave background. Now, this map is only the first step. It's not sensitive enough to say, yes, these are inflational waves or not. This, we are far from that. We probably need uh, other instruments from the ground, from space in the uh, long term. Uh, but if we are able to do that, we will be able to investigate the very early universe a few uh, split seconds, really, after the Big Bang. And this is uh, the challenge for the future. So I stop here.